In 1731, the Swedish East India Company was granted a royal charter by King Frederick I, allowing the company to conduct international trade with all lands east of the Cape of Good Hope. From then until 1813, the company made 132 voyages between Sweden and Asia. Eight of those voyages ended in disaster, but the rest were highly successful, bringing the company's shareholder huge profit from the sale of exotic goods like tea, spices, silk and China's famous porcelain. Some of the finest examples of porcelain traded at that time had been transported back to China for a three-month exhibition at the Palace Museum at the Forbidden City, at the center of Beijing. There is a story to be told that uh, will fascinate the Chinese uh, uh, public. Why did we have this huge trade? Why was Chinese porcelain, Chinese furniture, Chinese culture is so uh, very, very attractive? An important part of the story of Sweden's fascination with China is the story of the porcelain trade between the two countries. Most of this was so-called export porcelain, which was custom-made by Chinese factories for European markets. Uh, the project is to bring to China the export porcelain, the type of porcelain exported from Qingdezhen especially to Sweden and to Europe in the 18th century, starting with the East India trade, 1730s and onwards. This most of the porcelain for this exhibition comes from museums and private collections in Gothenburg in Sweden. At the beginning of September 2005, the museum started packing the selected artifacts for transportation by air freight back to China. At his shop, Antique West, porcelain historian and dealer Björn Gramner prepares for the exhibition. This is uh, a piece made for the Swedish King Gustav III to celebrate his revolution in the 1776. At the East India time from 1731 then to 1813 uh, made Gothenburg to be nearly the major city of Sweden because this was the biggest industry, the biggest company ever created in, in Sweden. So it's like taking Volvo and, and SAS and ABB together in one company. It was so enormous. The porcelain trade was particularly profitable because for the wealthy it was the must-have household item at that time. It was fashionable to drink hot drinks. Uh, this was new to Europe and it arrived with um, uh, the new drinks, coffee, chocolate and tea. There was no proper material for drinking hot drinks. So porcelain was the ideal material and it arrived together with the tea. So it was natural. Carefully packed, the porcelain is now making its way back to China. The porcelain is driven in a truck to the Forbidden City at the heart of Beijing. There it will be displayed in the new gallery atop the Wu Men Gate, since 1420 the main entrance to the Forbidden City. Uh, I think we have been very interested in this exhibition. This exhibition is very good. The whole exhibition is the most important part the next day, the porcelain is delivered to the gallery for inspection and installation. To, to show uh, what kind of porcelain European enterprises bought in the 18th century.
The very first piece unveiled is a bow from the Northern Song Dynasty, estimated to be valued at over half a million US dollars. I feel relaxed. It's all under control. And I hope it will be a nice uh, surprise for the Chinese uh, visitors here that uh, they made a lot of things and that we treasure them so much and the way that we even brought them back here. You would never do this exhibition, you would never build a ship if you didn't believe strongly in the future of our relations and the significance of China uh, for us, for Sweden. I hope it will increase the curiosity between the countries. So more Swedes will go to China and more Chinese will go to Sweden. Uh, that I hope. <laughs>